This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thank you to all of you, including Pepper Giese, Eric Holm, and Carmine Bailey. Coming up on DTNS, Disney continues to throw spaghetti at the streaming wall, modular gadget design comes to headphones, and Scott Johnson is talking good and bad about the rogue ally. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 11th, 2023. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From the 54th biggest city in the U.S., I'm Rich Trappolino. From the largest prehistoric salty lake in the United States, I'm Scott Johnson. And from the biggest state of the United States, I'm Amos. <laughs> well, uh, Lyft uh, announced today that it's going to discontinue pooled rides. You might recall that Lyft was the first to launch shared rides back in 2014. Uber later followed with Uber Pool, but Lyft is making some changes. With that, let's start with the quick hits. <laughs> WhatsApp announced that it now offers back-end updates to tackle spam calls, a particular issue in India. The company says it's using AI and machine learning systems to bring down spam call incidents. Based on reports from users, malicious actors have been making calls from phone numbers with international codes from countries like Ethiopia, Indonesia, Kenya, Malaysia, and Vietnam, often promoting fraudulent job offers. Well, U.S. chip imports rose 13% in the first quarter of this year as the supply chain issues are starting to subside, finally some relief. At the same time, the sources of these chips is beginning to shift. Malaysia is still the top source of U.S. chips because that's where the packaging plants are, but the number of chips coming from Malaysia to the U.S. fell 32% year over year. Chips from China fell 10.8%, not really too surprising. Meanwhile, Thailand, Vietnam, and India all saw significant gains. Taiwan maintained its slot as the second biggest source of U.S. chips, rising 8.1%. The Chinese e-commerce giant JD.com announced that its CEO, Zhu Lei, will step down in June, citing personal reasons. Zhu took over from company founder Richard Liu in April of 2022. Current CFO, Sandy Ran Zhu, will step into the new role. Twitter, it's a social network if you haven't heard of it, launched encrypted direct messages for verified users, either paid or through an organization. The launch does not support group messages, and metadata is not encrypted, and it doesn't offer key checks yet that would alert a user if their conversation has been compromised by something like a man-in-the-middle attack. Twitter says it will continue to work on improving the features. Feels very V1 right now. Peloton recalled around 2.2 million bikes, specifically bike model PL01, due to a determination there was a chance the bike could break during use. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission received more than 24 reports of the seat post either breaking or detaching during use. The model was sold in the U.S. between January of 2018 and May of 2023. <music> All right, Rich, let's talk a little bit more about the ever-evolving world of streaming, specifically Disney's plans going forward. So what's the latest? Yeah, let's talk some numbers. The company lost streaming subscribers for the second quarter in a row, falling by $4 million across its properties. So combined, they have 157.8 million subscribers. As before, though, just for some context, the losses came mostly from declines in Disney Plus Hotstar, which lost its rights to stream Indian Premier League cricket matches last year. And if you don't know anything about cricket, that's like a really huge Big deal. deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the U.S. and Canada, Disney Plus lost about 300,000 subscribers, but added nearly 1 million in international markets if you exclude Disney Plus Hotstar. Yeah, so as for the future of all things Disney streaming, CEO Bob Iger told investors on Wednesday that the company is now offering a combined Disney Plus and Hulu app, but each app will still be offered individually. Iger also passed along that negotiations for Disney to buy out Comcast's remaining minority stake in Hulu were cordial. Okay. Also on the investor call was CFO Christine McCarthy, who said that the company is, quote, in the process of reviewing the content on our DTC services, uh, direct to consumer, to align with the strategic changes in our approach to content curation. And we'll be removing certain content from our streaming platforms. Now, given Disney's issue with subscriber retention, looking at these latest numbers, do more options seem better or more confusing? Scott. Well... 
I don't know. This smells like HBO three, four months back. Remember that? We were all freaking out and all this stuff they were saying at Warner, and you were like, oh, what is going on at HBO? Yeah, yeah. I have a feeling it might be the same thing going on here. Um, yeah, I don't think that having three apps, a separate Hulu app, a Disney Plus app, and now a combined app is very great customer wise. I think it's confusing. Um, I'm still confused about what uh, I will end up doing as a user of those two different apps and I subscribe to them separately. Um, I have no desire to do commercial content, so I'm not going to drop those and then do a single one for a commercial curated price. I know I can do the higher priced one and do that, but I'm already paying essentially that exact same amount of money. In fact, I think it might even be less. Maybe they're trying to push people like us out eventually so that they can unify all of this. Mm -hmm. But we talked, you know, earlier today and it's been on my mind, this idea that, Disney's always seem to have um, a Touchstone Pictures side of them. <laughs> For those that remember the 80s and 90s when you'd see Touchstone, you were like, oh, this is interesting. This sort of semi-naughty PG-13, PG movie is over <laughs> here. And I thought Disney may have, but I guess not. It's Touchstone. Well, Touchstone was Disney, and it was Disney's outlet for things that weren't uh, the, yeah, the ultimate Yeah, if you're not watching Cinderella, film. you might watch something. Exactly. So you might watch Splash, uh, you know, Touchstone film, and then turn right around and watch an animated feature from Disney proper. And I always felt like after the Hulu acquisition, or at least the majority acquisition, this always felt like their version of that for a modern era. So they would have Disney Plus for all the Disney Plus stuff, Star Wars, Marvel, all that fits under that umbrella pretty well. And then everything else, their deal with FX and Fox and all these other things uh, where, you know, the contents can be a little more edgy. This isn't a site for kids necessarily, although there's a lot of kids animation it just felt like a really smart fit to me, and it seemed logical, and I was totally cool with it. Um, now that they're talking about bringing them under one umbrella, at least as a third option, uh, just smells a little confusing. Like, I don't think people are going to get it, especially if you're already subbed. Now, if you're not subbed at all, and you might see one of these tiers and go, well, finally, I'm going to I'm gonna get yeah. on this Disney bandwagon, you know? Speaking of the tiers, so so here are current offerings that Disney Plus, um, it, you know, I, I got it in my in email inbox this morning. So Disney Plus and Hulu as a duo basic model is ad supported, and that gives you, you know, a variety from both libraries for $10 a month. Trio basic is the same, but it also includes ESPN Plus content, not all of it, but, you know, a fair amount for $13 a month. Then Trio Premium, Scott, this might, uh, you know, be sort of what you're looking for if you're looking for something that's commercial free. It's ad free for all but sports. They're still going to put ads on sports. Yeah. Plus, you have the option to download content ahead of time and be able to watch it offline. You know, none of this stuff is is bad news. But yeah, like you were saying, if if you're a if you're a Disney Plus subscriber and you're like, ah, I just like this. I don't I don't want to change my subscription. It sounds like, at least according to Bob Iger, they're not taking that away. Not right now. I, I have to assume that the company is like, let's give people every option they possibly could have that they need to pay for. And then we figure out down the road what we drop later. Well, yeah. I think part of it is also, hey, let's not rock the boat. Like, let's not make people mad when, you know. Even if you take out Disney Hotstar, they're losing subscribers in two of their biggest markets, the U.S. and Canada. So let's not rock the boat and take away things. We all know consumers don't like it when we take away things. But, you know, we can see, like, clearly, like, a lot of these bundles are ready. If you go to, like, Hulu.com, they're pushing those bundles extremely hard. That's the first thing you see when you go there. And I'm assuming when this app comes out, that will be the first thing that will go there. What what kind of signals to me that it feels like this, this Hulu acquisition is going to go through is they could have done something that a lot of other places do with like HBO Max or something like that and frame this as we're going to offer Hulu as an add-on within the Disney Plus app and you can choose to add that into your experience if you want it in this one app, but you don't. And, but to me, the fact that they're saying like, no, 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 this will be a single app for both of these experiences signal like you, you don't do that unless it's going to stay like that for a really long time. No. And and for me, that all feels like stickiness, right? Let's put more content into this thing. Technically, you're probably going to save a few bucks, uh, I'm sure, when, when they launch it at, at whatever price they launch it at versus getting both of the services separately or, or maybe at the same price as the basic bundle is right now. And then move and, and keep that stickiness, right? Because you have this one app that you're used to watching your stuff and, oh, it turns out I'm not really watching much Disney or Star Wars stuff, but you know I am leaning into this Hulu stuff. To me, this is all about putting up 
minor speed bumps to be like, all right, so I'm gonna have to unsubscribe from the main thing, then I'm gonna have to pick up the Hulu subscription separately, because even if they still maintain it, you know, that, that minor inconvenience of, and that's gonna cost me like an extra two bucks, all of those speed bumps are like, hey, we we still have prop we have properties that people really like to spend money on, uh, and 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 want to engage with across these various apps. But let's put them all together, make it stickier uh, in an age where where people are kind of you know double checking uh, their subscriptions. I think that yeah, makes they, sense they for might Disney. be able to they might be able to successfully rope the two together, and I, and all my concerns will be for not. It just feels like a strange move to go from Disney, which is a very outward facing brand. And Hulu, which is a very internet-facing brand, going the other direction, bringing them together and saying, hey, what if they're in one app? You want your Handmaid's Tale? Sweet. Go right over and watch Bluey right after that. <laughs> like It's a kind of a weird a weird mix of content. I hope it works out for them, and it makes sense for me as a user to jump over to a single app. I'm all for consolidation when it makes sense. The, it's just the, hard to tell at this stage. The other thing to think about, though, is if they start cutting on content spend, right? A lot less noticeable when you have Hulu and Disney together in one app. That suddenly there's a lot less content out there. If you're, if you know, you're, if you're trying to rein in your spending, than it is if you have those discrete. So I think that's part of it as well. There you go. Well, let's uh, talk about gadgets that we can pick apart and make better, Scott. Yeah, heck yeah. Let's talk about Fairphone. Um, you've heard the name before on the show, I'm sure, everybody. It's known for its modular smartphone designs for easy repair. Well, now Fairphone is doing the same with FairBuds XL. This is a 240 euro, uh, that's what they're going to cost you, pair of over-ear wireless noise-canceling headphones that the company says have the same repairable slash upgradable design as its phones. Um, they're already available starting today in European markets. So, Rich, let's talk about this. How do these headphones compare to others right now? I, I think pretty good. Here's the specs that we got um, from Fairphone. The Fairbuds XL will have 26 hours of battery life with active noise cancellation. This is big for these over-the-ear headphones. The idea is you're going to be like traveling with them. So look at 30 hours without. They also have some water and dust resistance, IP54 rated. And there's a little, like, they say a joystick. It really looks more like, I don't know, a control nub uh, kind of on the right ear to, to kind of toggle through settings and stuff like that. It'll have a USB-C port. There is no, like, hardware wire audio connection, but you can do audio out through the USB-C and Fairphone will sell you a USB-C to 3.5 millimeter cable if you want to go wired for your sound. But the big news, of course, repairability, uh, kind of hard to come by when we're looking at headphones. The Verge actually reached out to a couple of different headphone manufacturers, talking to Bowers and Wilkins and Bose about battery swappability, but both said their headphone batteries weren't replaceable. Then neither Sony or Apple officially responded to the Verge's inquiries. Uh, Apple advertises $79 for an out-of-warranty battery repair uh, on the AirPods Max, so definitely possible uh, with the headset. But it seemed like most manufacturers just wanted to either give you a new pair if the battery dies while it's on warranty or... Uh, you know, give you a discount if it's out of warranty. But Sarah, the big question is how will this how will this repairability stuff work with headphones? Yeah, so Fairphone sells headphone replacement parts on its own website, like batteries, ear cushions, headband components. Again, these are over-the-ear headphones that we're talking about here. Most of what's swappable in the Fairbuds XL is within two main speaker units. The company offers a two-year warranty that covers manufacturer defects like if you have a faulty USB-C charging port or a battery that's, you know, junk, with the idea that replacement components can be sent to users for them to install themselves. And then Fairphone will reuse recycled discarded parts that, uh, you know, for example, if I take out a battery, send it back to the company, Fairphone says, we'll take care of it for you. So Scott, does the right to repair crowd, which, you know, that's a that's a that's a that's a crowd, feel like the right market for headphones specifically? Well, maybe more so than I've always been skeptical of the phone side of it, because um it's to me it's a jack of all trades, master of none problem where all the components are it's cool that you can swap them out, but how is the full experience? And I used to kind of have this problem with smartphones in general in the early days, but those are all, you know, kind of what they are now. And and so who knows, maybe the, the that kind of thing will improve with phones over time. But when it comes to accessories like headphones, or really I could think of a lot of these, keyboards, mice, different kinds of, mm -hmm. of peripherals, this makes a lot of sense. Um, I just replaced a pair of headphone pads on the outside of, not these, but a different headset. And uh, they were third party and they didn't quite fit right. They claimed they did. 
Uh, they're <laughs> weirdly patty and fuzzy and kind of just not the same. And they also got rid of the L and the R inside, so I could tell which one was supposed to be for which year. <laughs> maybe maybe that's why they don't fit right because you got them backwards. Yeah, it's a real that's a weird <laughs> feeling uh, to not really know. But uh, so that's not the best experience, even with those kinds of replacements. Uh, this is a much more interesting uh, concept. Really, all that matters here, if they can get the price right and if the sound is on par with the best thing Bose or, or uh, uh, can't think of another brand, any other brand with their with their great noise, noise isolating phones, if they can sound as good as those headphones and offer this kind of interoperability and repairability, then I think this actually could be a real home home run. And I think it's actually the way you eventually get people to buy their more of their phones as you prove this out with these smaller examples. But I think this is such an easier sell than the phone because a phone is such a, it, it's a part of your work life. It's part of like so many different aspects of your life. And there, there's a direct comparison, right? Like you had your old phone, you'll, you'll play with someone else's phone. And you'll see like, I'm using an older processor. It has less RAM. This phone is less responsive. The camera is like marked. Like a lot of compromises a lot of time come with a lot of these modular phones, whereas headphones Audio is so subjective, really the noise cancellation just needs to be good enough for the flight, right? This is what this these pair of headphones are kind of trying to hit at is that classic Bose, you know, quiet comfort over the ear. Uh, I just want the plane noise to get drowned out in the background. And that's actually where the modularity, I think, comes in handy because you have something that the road warriors are going to have these in their bag, right? They're going to get knocked around a lot. There's a lot more chance that stuff gets beat up and, oh, Turns out I can just swap out the headband or something like something that's like kind of really hard to do, like on these Sony cans and stuff like that. You can I, I could see this being very popular with Road Warriors if they can, again, you know, make sure it just meets a bare uh, amount of functionality of it needs to connect really well. The noise cancellation should be good enough. Audio is subjective enough as long as it's not garbage. And it seems like why, why would I don't I'm assuming it wouldn't be garbage that that makes a very compelling case, I feel like. And the price is in the ballpark of a lot of these uh, like noise canceling over the ear headphones. Yeah, I mean, I really haven't, you know, of of uh, the variety of wireless uh, earbuds, and they've really been buds, not over the ear uh, headphones that I've had in the past, haven't had a whole big issue but they're also relatively new. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the, my 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 Sony monitor uh, headphones that I use for kind of everything, uh, this show included, um, they definitely need new ear pads to, you know, to your point, Scott, uh, every now mm-hmm. and then. Um, and yeah, it's not super heard, but I'm not really replacing components. Right. Um, the, you know, if for some reason something within, you know, a noise canceling feature, which the, the, uh, headphones I'm wearing right now don't have, so it's a moot issue. But um, if that was something that was not that hard for me to do and just save me the trouble of you know shipping something back and forth and p- perhaps spending more money or going to a third party vendor where I'm not even getting what I thought I was getting, you know, I, I think I think uh, you know Fairphone knows that it has a, a very specific built in audience here. Um, if, if the sort of goodwill to your consumer base ends up being something that other companies adopt in the future, then I think that's where it gets interesting. Yeah. Fair enough. I would say. (laughs) Yeah. See what you did there. Uh, speaking of fair or not fair, uh, sometimes news breaks during our show. Uh, and we just wanted to mention that Elon Musk just tweeted, he has hired a new CEO for Twitter who's going to take the reins in the coming weeks. Now, if you'd like to share and discuss breaking news, just like DJ Stangle did in our Discord, you can join our Discord by linking to your Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, we have seen a surge in Windows-based handheld gaming devices, and the big one that caught a lot of people's attention was the Asus Rogue Ally, and it's now available for pre-order. The reviews are also out for it, and been checking those out. It sells for $700 and will be shipping June 13th, while a less powerful model will be available for order later this year for $600. Uh, the Ally outspecs Valve's Steam Deck pretty much across the board when you're looking at processor, uh, screen, and that kind of stuff. But, Scott, as a Steam Deck owner, how does yeah. this appear to stack up for maybe some of your pain points with the console? Well, this is actually pretty cool. Um, it's also really good competition in this space. There hasn't been a, a lot. Like, everything that's sort of come in the wake or even prior to the Steam Deck's release has been a little bit underwhelming. This one is at least whelming. And the... Um, <laughs> 
the device itself, while you mentioned the specs are better kind of across the board, they're incrementally better. They're not like massive. Um, that's the one thing I kind of wish. And some of the review, reviewers are, are reflecting this. The Verge's Sean Hollister, for example, says um, the Ally still doesn't match the Steam Deck's combo of battery life, portability, and price. I would agree with that. Um, I have not had my hands on one yet. The one place where I, I do know it's going to be kind of awesome is in its performance. Uh, also, being a Windows-based device, that means that, you know, with, with the way that Steam work, the Deck works with Proton to make Windows games work uh, on the device it can be a little squirrely, especially if you're older games and the developers haven't gone through the work to make it ready and all that. So there's some issues there. Not many, but some. This won't have those. If your game runs on Windows, it will run on this device with reasonable settings, maybe not maximum, but that's also true of the Steam Deck. You can't run a lot of things on maximum settings. Um, I think this is positioned quite well, especially coming from a company like Asus, who knows the gaming market, uh, the ROG, uh, or ROG, ROG, some people say Rogue. Uh, their line of products are well uh, regarded in gaming circles, their notebooks, all that sort of thing. So this is a brand people like and trust. So my, my suspicion is, this will actually appeal to a slightly more hardcore version of a potential Steam Deck owner, somebody who wants to get maximum Windows compatibility, which is going to make things like running good old games or running games off the Epic Store or all the many other various places you may have picked up your video games over time. Those are going to play kind of ready to go out of the box, no questions asked. Steam has a little bit more of a mixed, uh, you know, a mixed bag when it comes to that. Um, do I want one? I wish the price was a little lower. I think 700 bucks is sort of a, as a, as a minimum is a little on the, on the high side. I kind of wish they had a range there. That being said, it's only, I think 50 more than I paid for the maxed out steam deck I got. So I don't know why that's a problem for me. Um, I think I'm more thinking about just its general adoptability, but overall my big take is this is very good for the space. And, uh, I'll bet we see more of this. Um, the Steam Deck is a kind of a hands-down success in every possible way. And um, their follow-up will be interesting as well. They've already come out and said, look, we're not doing one every year like a phone where you feel like you have to go get out and get the latest version. That made a lot of gamers happy. But I have a feeling it made some of their competitors water at the mouth and think, well, maybe we'll do that. And maybe we'll be quick about our updates and really, you know, bog down the, the market on this. But I think overall it's good, and I'm very excited to get my hands on one and actually try it and, uh, you know, see if it stacks up. So let, let me ask you, one of the things that we saw kind of across uh, the reviews that we saw, like you said, Sean Hollister, uh, PC Mag's Matthew Buzzy, uh, and uh, Sherry Smith from uh, Laptop Mag that was just kind of perusing while we were going through prepping for the show. They all mentioned battery life not as good as the Steam Deck. Uh, some yeah. were saying around three and a half, four hours when you're kind of in the middle performance tier, but it can go down to like an hour if you're in like the max turbo mode where you're, you know, you really want to get the best quality. In terms of how you use a Steam Deck is like, does going from something like seven hours on a Steam Deck to four, like how much how much does that matter, I guess, to you? Like, are, are, is this like a sit back couch thing where you're always by a charger anyway or are you using this on the go? Um, it depends. I had a, a couple of trips here recently and on those trips I took the Steam Deck and I appreciate its ability to run a lot longer depending on what you throw at it. If I'm running a game that's got a lot happening, right? A lot of pushing a lot of polygons and a whole bunch of shaders and it's just like a big AAA experience. I'm expecting to get about three hours out of that experience, uh, mm -hmm. unless I turn on half pixels. Or, there's some other options you can do on the device we have to get into here. Um, but on games that are a little bit more, maybe in the indie space, they can still be 3D, but they're not sort of top tier in terms of pushing the hardware. Those games I can get five, six hours out of. And in some cases, like some pixelized indie roguelike or something, I can play that game for like sometimes eight or 10, depending on the game. Um, you know, your mileage may differ, but it does sound like comparatively this device is not going to do that. The other thing to really shed light on here is this will be a device that can and will play Steam games. It will load Steam. You'll run Steam in big picture mode, which is essentially the interface that's already on the Steam Deck, and you'll run your Steam games. It'll feel like a Steam Deck in many ways. But there is something nice about the Steam Deck's integration with the ecosystem uh, that makes that a, a great experience if you're in that ecosystem, right? And a lot of gamers aren't. A lot of people are like, I don't want to be tied to Steam or Epic or anyone else. I want to have my games just loose on my hard drive, and I want to install them the way I want to. That's always an option for most games still. Those people are going to be stoked about this. And 
that screen looks nice. Like there are a lot of good things to say, but to answer your question more succinctly, I think that battery life does matter and that will make a difference in the long run. So slimness is nice. Battery <laughs> life is nicer. <laughs> Well, while you're enjoying battery life, um, maybe you're, I don't know, watching a television that runs on a battery. I don't know. But if you're not familiar with the long-running TV series Antiques Roadshow, you might be asking yourself, where is she going with this? The premise is that people who, who think they might have rare and expensive antique items bring them onto the show, have them appraised, and you get mixed results. Not a lot of tech. It's usually, you know, old chests of drawers or a doll or a painting. But a recent guest brought a binder containing all 102 original base set Pokemon cards, and the appraiser knew exactly how valuable they were. The backstory is that the owner's mom bought the full base set of cards um, as a gift for her son back in 1999 for $35. Appraiser Travis Landry, who, you know, got a handed to Travis, knew an impressive amount of information about Pokemon, said that today... The Pokemon card market is really volatile. A lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, it kind of things went up in value when people were home, maybe trading more more cards in general, you know, pandemic era. So he said the set could have sold for as much as $15,000 a couple of years ago when Pokemon trading was at a peak, but the binder is still worth anywhere from even by conservative cents 500 to $10,000. That is a pretty good ROI. That is a good ROI, and the person who owns that is going to need it because millennials, uh, I'm one of you, I have to inform you now, your childhood now constitutes as antiques. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I know. I'm sorry, your yep. knees are hurting, your neck hurts today. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's a bleak future, but at least you may have some savings and some extensive Pokemon collections. It's like how I feel when I listen to a classic rock station where I'm like, <laughs> oh, so 90s. Yeah, Got or when it. someone That's... tells you uh, classic gaming is now uh, 2003's GameCube uh, Mario Kart or something, yeah. it doesn't, <laughs> yeah, none of that. Right. None of that feels right. It feels very weird to say it. Oh, uh, all right, Rich. Let's check out what's in the mailbag today. Uh, well, we got a message from Adam in San Diego, and he was talking about the Pixel tablet. We were talking about it announced at Google I.O. after some extensive leaking. He was, he was saying, I was really looking forward to using the new Pixel tablet as a home hub when it was on the dock and as a tablet when it wasn't. The fact that it can't do this was not only surprising, but extremely disappointing. This was a total deal breaker for me, so I didn't order it. Uh, and uh, there was an article in Ars Technica from uh, Ram, uh, um, excuse me, Ron Amadio uh, saying that Google's Pixel tablet looks just like a smart display, so why isn't it one? So you are not alone, Adam. The one thing I will say, so I did some research on this. There, there's some workarounds we can do. Uh, Google Photos has a, a background memories wallpaper you could set. So if you want like that photo frame kind of feel to it, you could have that on your lock screen. There are lock screen widgets. So if you want your calendar when you look at it, but I, but I get it. Like I, I, I have a Google Hub. I enjoy using it. I enjoy that it's like a very passive experience. And I feel like Android is you're going to be tinkering with it when it's on the dock, and that's not what you want. I get it, Adam. Yeah, I, I encourage everybody to look at the Ars Technica article, which which really does lay out like, OK, this looks like a Google Nest Hub and does a lot of the things that it's supposed to do, except that it's not a smart display for kind of no good reason. They look really similar product wise, at least on the outside. Yeah. It uh, it's a it's a little baffling. One thing, though, not baffling is my thanks to Scott Johnson, though, for being on the show. It makes total sense to me why I'd be thankful. He brought the fire. He brought the heat. He brought the great take. Scott, where can people find more of your great stuff if they're so inclined? Well, I'm I'm shocked by this turn of events. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm going to uh, tell fine folks at home that. Well, first of all, huge thanks. I know there have been some BTNS folks that went out first week and supported my new Kickstarter for my tabletop game called Dungeon Murder at DungeonMurder.com. If you go to DungeonMurder.com, it should take you directly to the Kickstarter, which is still running for another week and a half, two weeks. Uh, we blew through our, our goals, but we have stretch goals to meet, and I'm very excited about a couple of those. So if you like a great game for one to five people, eight years and up, who can just sit and have a great time on a Friday night, boy, have I got good news for you. Check it out at DungeonMurder.com. Dungeon Do it. Murder. Do it now. <laughs> or in a few minutes when we're done here. Uh, yeah. Before we're done, though, we want to extend a special thanks to JCCIM, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, JCCIM. Big round of applause. Woo -hoo -hoo. 
And by the way, Tom has mentioned this a couple times in earlier shows if you've been listening, but just for a reminder, money might be a little tight right now. We get it. So you can consider joining our Patreon for free. Scroll past the paid options at patreon.com slash DTNS and you get things like monthly updates, Rogers column, and the Friday GDI, which is always a fun GDI. And remember, patrons, stick around for Good Day Internet. It's our extended show. We'll be going over Teenage Engineering's new field recorder. I know, hold your excitement. It looks super cool. It's also pricey as heck. We'll bring yeah. it all down. Oh, it's good stuff, though. Don't miss it. Hopefully, you'll stay with us. But just a reminder that DTNS is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with that fun Friday GDI we talked about. Plus, Chris Ashley will be with us for the whole time. We're talking tech and we're playing quizzes. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>